welcome you all to the MOOC course on urbanization policies. These words of Mother Teresa resonate with many who believe that there is a big purpose of this life for the betterment of fellow human beings or world at large. In India, urban centers have existed since the time of Indus Valley Civilization and towns and cities have existed in history. But despite this historical evidence, traditionally, if you see, sociological studies focused mainly on villages as unit. In India, sociologists have focused more on studying rural than metropolitan centers. Now, let us come to the topic urbanization. It is one of the most common characteristics of economic development. With the gradual growth of economy, the process of urbanization also depends on the shift. Shift, when I say, of surplus population from rural to urban areas. Now, you have to know why these people from rural areas come to the urban areas. They come in search of jobs. They come in search of a good life. They come in search of better technologies which they can use for their purpose of life. Now, if industrial growth is rapid, so too is urbanization today. Now, urbanization as a topic has gathered considerable momentum in the recent times. And let me tell you, this has put a tremendous infrastructural developments, a pressure on the infrastructure structures as well as services. Say, for example, there are many cities in India, Mumbai, in Delhi, there are cities where they get water supply only for two to four hours a day. Smaller cities, because of their lack of infrastructure, because of lack of financial services, they found it really difficult to cope with the increasing demands on the services. Now, let us come to few topics which you should all know in urbanization policies. First, let us describe what is an urban place. Now, when I say urban place, it is just an area demarcated as urban. It is not necessary, they have to go by the boundary. So, geographical limits is not a matter here. It is determined more by the certain characteristics of those urban population, right? Next comes urban agglomeration. The second very, very important small subtopic within this urbanization policies. In fact, United Nations have described it as a large locality of a country. It is often a part of urban agglomeration, which comprises of the city, the towns proper, and also suburban fringes which may lie outside the fringes of the territory. Then comes your term urbanism. When I talk about urbanism, it is nothing but it is a way of life associated with the living in those urban areas. Now, when you look into the characteristics of urban life, it can be, it can be described exhaustively. There can be many, many points that you can include under the term urbanism. It can be individualism, it can be rationalism, impersonal relationships, secondary institutions, multiplicity, fast transport, large amount of technologies, very, very complex life and better technological facilities because each one of them want to lead a good life. Now, let us come to the term, what is urbanization? The term which is the most important topic in this particular topic, it is a process of increasing percentage of a territory's population that resides in a town and cities through a complex combination. Combination of what? Economic, demographic, social, cultural, technological and environmental phenomena. Now, in this entire canvas of urbanization, population term is very, very important. Now, what is population? It is one of the most important measure of urbanization. It is the important source of data that you should consider. So, when we try to measure organization, the process of urbanization, there are four demographic aspects that you need to keep in mind. First, degree of urbanization. Second, tempo of organization. Third, concentration and dispersion of population. And last, the components of urban growth. Then comes the most important measure of urbanization. That includes percentage of population in that area, ratio of urban rural population, size of locality or the residence, and tempo of organization. Now, let us give a very, very simple description. Now, before that, before we start with the calculation, the percentage of population, let us go back and check some of the MCQs. If you can all sit down and solve the first four questions of the MCQ. Let us come to the percentage calculation of population. Now, let me tell you when you see PU, it is the percentage of urban population. U stands for urban population and P stands for total population. So, the formula is PU which is equal to U, that is urban population divided by the total population into 100. 
The numbers which you can see in the screen are the numbers given by 1971 census. Those numbers, if you calculate, you will get that number. But let me tell you, it is when you look at it, it is very, very easy to calculate, but it has certain weaknesses. Now, let us look into what are the challenges that urbanization as a phenomena has, right? Now, state of urban structure, if you ask me, in most of the cities in India have deteriorated to a great extent. Why? Because they are not able to take the full benefit from the running economies. There are a lot of reasons for it, congested roads, poor public transport, inadequate availability of water, treatment of sewage, uncollected solid waste, decreasing all this really have a great impact on the quality of life that the people are having, right? So total well-being of the urban population gets deteriorated. Towns and cities, no doubt, they contribute immensely to economic development of any country. Now, to keep these transformations in line, in the needs, in line with the needs of the grassroots level is the most important duty or you can say it is the most important uh, contribution that a person and their representatives are having. So each person, each representative should be fully involved in the planning and implementation of programs at all local levels. Now, what are the solutions? If somebody asks to how to find out certain solutions to all these urbanization problems, every country for that matter, every state in India, say for example, if we take Indian example, every state needs to invest in infrastructure. They have to support urbanization. When I say supporting urbanization, it means investments in roads, highways, airports, ports, water supply, sanitation facilities, waste management. Another very, very important initiative where the government can take is affording housing. When I say affordment, it is tax incentives, subsidies, low interest loans. That has to be given to all the people in town. Another very, very important aspect which every government has to take care of is the improved public transport. When I say public transport, buses, metro rails, light trains, reducing traffic congestions, and improving the air quality, reducing pollution. That is also another initiative the governments have to take. Another very important, and you can say the least, the last one is the urban planning, improved urban planning. Urban planning should be improved to ensure that cities are very, very well planned. They are organized. When I say organizing within the city, zone regulations, land use regulations, urban designing, planning it, executing it, and make sure that the planning sustains for a very, very long time. Now, economic growth will inevitably lead to a huge pace in urbanization as cities are providing large economies of agglomeration for individual activity. But maintaining it and sustaining it is what is important and that has to be taken care of by the government. There are a lot of times that you may get confused between urbanization and industrialization. Now, let me tell you, urbanization and industrialization are not necessary corollaries in the modern usage. They are used as such now, if somebody asks you in layman terms, industrialization is nothing but use of machine power, machine power for the process of production. And in modern sense, if you ask me, it refers to construction of big, big factories. Now, urbanization, on the other hand, is a way of life that is peculiar to agglomeration of heterogeneous, heterogeneous population, because you know, in a city, we get people from different backgrounds. Industrialization, no doubt, is connected with urbanization so far as it leads to urbanization due to the demands of factory production. But industrialization leads to a wider scale of urbanization, but it is not confined to mere industrialization alone. Here, I want all of you to go through the MCQ again and try to solve the next three questions which are there in the MCQ. Take your time and try to see whether you are able to answer the questions there. Now, on the whole, if you say urbanization is increasing globally, India, China, Nigeria, they are the nations that are urbanizing at a very, very fast rate. In fact, they are expected to contribute around 35 percent of the increase in the global urban population between 2018 and 2050. Urbanization in India is a process of transformation. When I say transformation, it is from a rural to an urban society. It is a process of rapid population growth in cities, in towns, 
people from rural areas to urban areas. It is one of the most rapidly urbanizing countries in the world now. Now let us go to the constitutional background. You know, Constitution of India has given a detailed provisions for ensuring the protecting the democracy, not only in parliament, but in the state legislature. Now, before going back to that, let us see that what kind of constitutional provisions are already there. And you should all know about the 74th constitutional amendment that has brought about an immense change when it comes to protecting democracy in state parliaments as well as state legislatures. In context of Indian constitution, local government bodies are the subject at the state list and thereby governed by state legislatures. And in case of union territories, it is governed by the union parliament. Now, when I talk about recognition of the local government, it is expressed by, as I said, the 74th Constitutional Amendment Act, which was introduced in the parliament in 1992. Now, why this was introduced? It was introduced for devolution of powers, devolution of authorities, responsibilities, democratic decentralization that happened to give the local self-government bodies the constitutional backup. So both 73rd and the 74th constitutional amendments both were introduced in the 1990s. To be specific, 1992. Now what happens? After the amendment was passed, the execution of economic development plans, which was stated in the 12th schedule, has been delegated to municipalities. When I say municipalities, there are a lot of functions that they execute. First being town planning, urban designing, regulation of land usage, building, construction, developing a plan for social economic growth, slum upgradation in improvement, supplying of features. When I say features, amenities like parks, gardens, playgrounds, street illumination, parking space, bus stations, which are easily available for public. Now let us be very, very specific now, Article 243G. If you can all see the screen, the legislature of any state by law grant the panchayats the powers and authority to carry out various programs, especially for social justice and economic development, right? Now, economic development plans, which are stated in the 12th schedule, has been delegated to municipalities. This includes, again, the points which I have already mentioned about the parks, urban development, illumination for public conveyance, all these are mentioned in the 12th schedule of the Indian Constitution. Now let us come to 243W. 243W talks about legislature of any state which or who can grant the municipalities the powers and authority that may be necessary to enable them to function as self-government. Institution of self-government is something which has been granted by the constitution according to article 243W. Now these laws have provided lot of provisions for decentralization of power, decentralization of authorities, responsibilities upon municipalities respectively at appropriate level. Now you may ask why specifically constitution has provided it. Let me tell you there were a lot of encroachments at one point of time over the revenue, over the functions of these municipalities. So to give a proper shape to the local self-government, these constitutional arrangements have been made and that became very, very popular. So public opinion really went in favor of clearly specifying the provisions in the constitution that will help this local self-government to work in a proper way. Now let us come to 243ZD and 243ZE. When I say 243ZD, it provides for a district level planning committee. Now this district level planning committee will consolidate the powers and will develop a plan for the entire district. Again by 243ZE, we see a constitution of a metropolitan area, a metropolitan planning committee which will take care of all the programs or matters related to common interest. When I say common interest, spatial planning, sharing of water, natural resources and also integrated development of infrastructure considering the environmental falls or environmental advantages as well. The district planning committee has been given authority to give or a give a blueprint how to consolidate the plans prepared by the panchayats and the municipalities. I have already given you the background of 74th amendment. If you can go through the slide, you check why the 74th amendment has been introduced. 
introduced for municipalities or urban local bodies, which can be considered as a constitutional entity to give an institutional framework so that this grassroots level democracy or democratic decentralization happens through self-governing local bodies in urban areas of the country. Basically, it gives the power to the municipalities to act in a way which is required in those localities. Now, I would like all of you to check again the MCQ whether you are able to solve the other three, four questions which are related to the constitutional provisions. Now, let us start with a very, very modern concept, cities, which you all mostly are aware of, right? It is, it can be considered as one of the most sophisticated objects that human beings have created. Now, since the day of industrial revolutions, we have seen cities have been the engines of economic growth. The revolution was effective in developing prosperity. For many, many countries, it has happened like that. But today, if you ask me, we are struggling to balance with the competing demands of our needs and also the allures of urban living. Cities have been the primary drivers of economic expansion. People who have resided in the city are motivated. They are good economic performers. They want to use technology. They want to do that to increase their chances. Cities have in turn attracted a lot of people who want to share the same views and want to settle down. Now let us come to the concept of smart cities. Now I am sure all of you are aware the goal of Indian government led by Prime Minister Narendra Modi to create 100 smart cities for a modern and resurgent India. In order to increase the productivity and sustainability, these sustainability and productivity are the two most important terms which you should all keep in mind when you read about smart cities. It suggests putting the citizen at the center of the governance, utilizing ICT to its maximum, especially we are we, because we all belong to the digital era. So Prime Minister's daring project was the Smart Cities mission, which was introduced in 2015. Now to spur the development of comparable smart cities in other regions, the government has established eligibility standards for localities. So each locality has to meet those standards to become a part of the program. Now, what is a smart city? If somebody asks you, as such, there are no proper definitions. But when I say smart cities, I look for, or what I want to know what you will look for when you define the term smart city. Concept like smart housing, smart utilities, smart design, smart mobility, and smart technology. Now, urban planners or people who are in the municipalities or in urban development should build a complete urban ecosystem which is represented by the four pillars of comprehensive development. Institutional pillar, physical, social and economic infrastructure. All these four points try to combine and meet the requirements and ambitions of urban life. Now, let us hear Dr. Inder Gopal, who is currently the CEO of India Urban Data Exchange, a pioneering program by the government of India to enable the use of data for the public load. Now, let us all hear from an expert what he thinks about the smart city concept. I am sure you have learned a lot from Dr. Inder Gopal, who spoke so much about the smart cities concept. So, if you ask me to summarize, if you want to know what we have learned today from all the slides and all the MCQs and Dr. Inder Gopal's speech, a small summary is how this entire concept of urbanization started way back from Indus Valley Civilization. Then we looked into what is a city, what are the problems that urbanization is today facing, what are the problems and what could be the solution. Then we also studied about the constitutional backup, the different provisions mentioned in the Indian constitution. We also learned about the 73rd and the 74th amendment where we learned about how everybody should get an equal chance to be part of the Panchayat Raj and also at the municipality level. We also learned about how constitution specifically mentioned about devolution or decentralization of power. We also learned about how protection of democracy happened at the parliament and also at the state legislature. Towards the end, we learned about cities. We also learned about the concept of smart cities and how Indian government is trying its best to reach out the target of getting 100 smart cities in a span of two to three years. I hope you all learned a lot about urbanization policies today. Thank you.